Now, say my name. The Rolling Bad Podcast. You're goddamn right. Welcome to the Rolling Bad Podcast, episode number 57, coming to you from the desolate wastelands of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're recording on November 24th. I'm your host, Bill Costello, and with me tonight is... Ryan Taylor. And we're still at it, even though we're Elric-less. Elric-less. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're not witless, we're Elric-less. <laughs> Elric-less, nice. Yeah. So today's show is going to be a return to our examinations of the realms. But we're going to do one super easy one and one medium one. We're going to do Azir and Shemo. So, Shemo. Yeah, Azir should take us all of about 45 seconds. But Shemo's got some, Shemo's got some history to it. So, Yeah, let's go a fair bit. Yeah. So it's going to be good. Yeah. We're also going to hear from Ryan and his exploits at the King of the Mountain Tournament, which I eventually did not get up to because I worked too late that day. We're going to talk about some prize packages that we're going to build up to send out because, you know, it's the holiday season. And I have a lot of stuff that has been donated to us from a couple of stores in town. And, of course, the Warhammer store, who has done an amazing job of letting us get the stuff that he doesn't give away that some people might actually want. So we're going to make up a, a series of boxes and send them out to people over the holidays and Later on in the show, we're going to tell you how about getting those if you want to enter our little contest. What else are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to touch base on the honestwargamer.com that launched this week. That's right. Um, and then we'll do our usual going through the 500 releases from oh, Games Workshop. My God, yes. <laughs> we'll try and condense it a little bit this week. Yeah, we're not going to go over. on and on and on. But there's yeah. still there's so much. That came out. It's crazy. It's the holidays, I guess. So that's going to do us. Yeah, I thought it was a fairly quiet week for Games Workshop. And then I looked at all the <laughs> Hobbit releases yeah. and everything like that. And I'm like, yep, nope. They just keep keep piling it out there. Yeah, they just, so. they're killing us. But I also have to make a comment about that later. Something interesting I heard about the release schedule and frequency and whether or not it's too much at one time. So I heard an interesting opinion on that. So hmm. we'll cover that in new dawn. So fantastic. Should well, we move on to new dawn? Let's move on All right, to then. new dawn. The realm of the new dawn, where we're going to talk about the releases from games workshop or and pre-orders um, that have come out in the last couple of weeks. So the first thing up, is the December Christmas boxes. Oh, my God. These things are so amazing. I, I know last week or last time we recorded, we hit the Seraphon box. That is just a crazy deal. You're getting about 190 bucks worth of free models buying that box. But, I mean, they also have the Ideneth Deepkin box, the Slaves to Darkness, and the Daughters of Cain box, which is really, I'm looking at kind of hard. These things are off the hook. You- yeah, they're they're great value. I mean, last year was great value as well. They seem to have kept that going this year. What is interesting is a couple of the ones that were released last year are still available. Yeah, in places. Yeah. So the Daughters of Cain one's great because there is no getting started box. Right? Yeah. So I think that fills a niche. And then I actually like the Deep Kim one. Yeah. Even though it gives you two sharks rather than a Leviathan, but it's still it's, it's a free couple of sharks. Well, and there, so. My wife wants to make a Nidneth Deepkin army, and she already bought a couple of models and built them, and she's starting to paint on them. And I'm looking at this box going, well, that's an instant Christmas right there. So, And she's only going to ever play narrative. She's not going to be competitive. So, And she just really r- enjoys the painting part of it the most. So that box hits her square in the head. Yeah, it's great. And the Seraphon one, even though it's the, the biggest deal, just comes with a bunch of stuff that you, you want to use in that army anyway. So, yeah, it's, if you're get, if you're thinking about getting started with Seraphon, that is a perfect box. So what else have we had released in the last week or so? The one that really made me sad was they released that box set for the Spear of the Emperor, which is a new Aaron Dembski Bowden book. But it came yeah. in a super cool presentation thing. 
with and, a bunch of yeah with coins and stuff game stuff in it yeah, yeah it has a, an objective marker a purity seal for a bookmark all this other really cool stuff in there and the decal sheet for the the chapter that he's writing about and mm-hmm. i was online literally about two to three minutes before 11 and it was already sold out I was like, oh, my God. Well, it's it's just temporarily out of stock. So. Yes, I did notice that. They went to temporarily. They didn't go completely. Said, no, sold out. It could maybe be because they, they maybe didn't expect it to sell out as quick. Well, it's a limited uh, thing. They said 1,500 copies at most. Yeah, but, well, this movie is a good thing, right? Maybe we'll get, get a few more made Yeah, without cheaping in the, the fact. The overall, yeah. It, it maybe just shows that they could maybe bump there because I think the runs for these books have been around that fifteen hundred. Yeah, that's um, generally so maybe what it's they time. Did. Yeah, maybe it's time to boost it up. Yeah, maybe. A bit. I mean, it even comes with chapter tactics. Yeah, it's for the for the the force, which is nuts. Also up for pre order today was the Citadel Hobby Project boxes and the paint boxes, the empty ones. So mm-hmm. if you already have all the paints and all that stuff, you now have an opportunity to get these empty and do what you want to do with them. So, and they look pretty cool, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah. And you can get the stand separately. Um, they even encourage you to attach it to the wall, but that seems like a, a terrible idea because um, it doesn't look like, well, so it looks like they fit snugly. I don't know if I'd be putting them on the wall where it's barely coming up halfway through. Yeah. So, Yeah. Um, but they do come with little stands, and you can add more to the little stand to make yes. it more secure and stuff. So that's cool. And whilst I was on the wrong site this morning, I thought they were thirty six bucks a pop, <laughs> um, and I was like, "Nah, that's that's too expensive for was, eighteen bucks. Maybe were, maybe it's good." Were you halfway around the world? <laughs> yeah, I was. I was visiting my mother in New Zealand. <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah, um, yeah. Use that. We had that, and then we did have the Vigilus Open Day today as well. That was so a we, serious 40K outpouring of love and affection. My God. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> um, before we, we touch on what was previewed there, there are a couple of more um, releases that actually went up on, yeah. on the GW site, so let's briefly touch on them. So uh, The Hobbit, we got some dice as well as some re-releases of models. Yeah, big time. Uh, new re-releases. Gandalf yeah, as well. New Gandalf, uh, a Theoden mounted and unmounted. I believe that's the one that came in the Battle of Pelennor Fields box. But you yeah, can get it separate yeah. now, you know, if you already had a Rohan army. Gandalf the White and Peregrine took. I think that's a redo, but I'm not sure. Yeah, they brought them into plastic. Previously, they were available as, or at least very similar. Yeah. They were available as resin, resin or mats. Yeah. So... But the big announcement there was the uh, the book is coming out for Armies of the Hobbit. So if you're interested in doing something before Lord of the Rings time frame and you want some of those older type things, it's all going to be in the book Armies of the Hobbit. So I definitely pre-ordered that one just because I'm a completionist. Yeah, re-release of a bunch of metal characters mm-hmm. as well as box deals. It looks like they've combined a couple of boxes oh, and yeah. foot groups to bring them together. So that's cool. They also did a bunch of uh, Adeptus Titanicus releases. Big thing there is the uh, Warlord Battle Titan with Plasma Annihilator and Power Claw. That thing's pretty huge. Plus, they uh, did the Imperial Serastus Knights and some transfer sheets for Legio Mortis and Legio Graphonicus. If AT is scratching your itch, there's a lot of cool stuff coming down. Yeah, I mean, it looks cool. (laughs) <laughs> I've, I've not touched on it yet but and plus they also released some data sheets some accessories as well which oh, yeah. i'm going to assume make the game easier so those are most of the pre-orders that went up today so i guess we can kind of move on to the open day i'll let you start off this was huge and I, I, given it's all 40k so we're not going to dwell on too much of it but well man. mostly 40k right right, right. <laughs> mostly. mostly um so yeah it was a 40k News from Vigilus. Okay, so Vigilus being the the key planet on one side of the rift, from what I know, and I don't know very much. So the fact that I know that is means that Games Workshop's doing a good job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so all the little box sets that have been releasing this year have been set on Vigilus, right. from what I can tell. Yep. Um, so it, it seems like Vigilus is going to be the new Armageddon. Yeah. 
for this edition. I'm just looking at the site here. So the, a lot of news from there. Gene Steeler Cults. Yep. A couple of new things for them. Their yeah. book's coming soon. Yeah. Um, including well, a really cool teaser, <laughs> which had uh, a little hollow uh, deck. Oh, my God. That I thing guess. is so cool. <laughs> um, which is actually the map of, of Nottingham. Yeah. Of, uh, their headquarters. <laughs> yep. So it looks like Gene Steelers want to go to a very specific place. Yes. Um, and take out uh, the world. Or on the world. <laughs> yeah. It looks like they want to take out one person by uh, one of the smaller buildings and then get into what looks like the top secret studio area. So that's super cool. Dirty a Gene little, Steelers. A little teaser. What else? Okay. So there's going to be a celebratory miniature based yes. on Jess Goodwin's original sketches yes. of. A noise marine. Yes. And it looks he great. looks cooler than candy. Yeah. He, I mean, yeah, it does look cool. There's no no two ways about it. If you like the it's aesthetic, of crazy, course. So. It's a crazy paint scheme, you, for well, sure. Yeah, just a yeah. little. And it's actually kind of cool to see new models painted like, I mean, it's got the goblin green base yeah. and everything in the picture. Check yeah. out Warhammer Community. Yeah. The throwback to the but, old days is huge. Yeah. So that, that'll be kind of cool one-off pick-me-up maybe they'll, they'll come through some other things but uh they're also releasing vigilus defiant so it's going to be a way to take part uh, through a campaign yeah on vigilus it's going to give you some rules for the first converted uh, space marine dun dun dun, dun. which is <laughs> marnus calgar yeah who would have thought uh, old marnie would be the first one to go through the the process to be changed into a i mean the model looks cool he's been a little bit whiny the last little while you know since Roboti came back yeah well so he did get kind of kicked out of his job in the span of an instant he went from chapter master of the ultramarines to you know some dude that wears blue never figured that he's just like what well, yeah i'll go through the additional training yeah sure i'll keep my spot yeah, yeah. I, I just want to make daddy <laughs> proud. <laughs> He's having daddy issues. So he is. I think uh, it's a really, that is a great looking model. And I know a few Ultramarines players that are just chomping at the bit to get their hands on that thing. And then on the other side of the coin, yes, there is Harkin the World Claimer, who's decided Vigilus will fall within 80 days. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's a bold statement there, buddy. But he looks super cool. He's got a spear from, uh, looks like the storm. I mean, he's got a spear. <laughs> yeah. Almost looks like uh, a custody spear or something. I don't, I don't know. It's it's pretty cool. I yeah. Know. For me, it looked a lot like a Stormcast spear, but it's got that same sort of leather banding. Yeah. It. But it looks like, the, you know, the Black Legion are coming. And if this guy is an image of what the new Raptors are going to look like, that's huge. I mean, I think they're going to be, they'll be really cool. If they kind of keep that thing going. Yeah, the only thing I'm disappointed with it is he doesn't have those talent feet. Yeah. You know, they, yeah, they were a kind of kill cool addition, but that's a minor niggle, right, on yeah. a, a great-looking model. Yeah. And I do wonder if we'll see Abaddon show up with a new scalp. Boy, I'll tell you, you yeah. know, that everything's kind of leading up to that. I'm hoping. I'm really hoping. I, um, I'm going to guess, and this is me, wild speculation here, that... Harkin the world claimer is going to fail. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, and then we'll see Abaddon come come across and yeah, and, and try to save thing. the day. But what we're fighting on Vigilus, there's new urban conquest coming out. So a city fighting campaign. Yeah, and this a, looks super interesting. It's a campaign system for putting together city fight campaigns. So I'm hoping this one brings a little more. It looks like it's got some interesting cards in it, and hopefully it's got you know interesting ways of putting together from the sound of it you're you're kind of going after enemy resources and supply lines and all that stuff and you're going to keep fighting in the same city area so you're going to build a map one time and then just keep fighting that fight so i'm i'm hoping it, it's cool because i always I like the that. idea of that yeah certainly i like i like the idea of a side game that can go into your big battle you know because this does still look like it'd be a biggish battle oh yeah but even if you could set up just a little bit smaller and have okay, we have to get this resource before before the end there. Yeah, you know, and that will give you a boost in the big battle, that sort of thing. Well, yeah, and I'm hoping it will allow you to play like smaller games too. You know, maybe a you know 750 point game 
maybe you just don't feel like dragging out 2000 points today, you know, play something smaller and still have it matter in the campaign. So, yeah, definitely. Another couple of Gene Steeler cults models that we didn't touch on. Yeah. Uh, a buggy, a little one man buggy, like super <laughs> cool. And then a couple of rough riders. And those are going to be conversion fodder for everybody. You know it. I mean, they just, they just look great and you wouldn't even know, right. That some of these people are Gene Steeler cults. So that's what exactly. I like. They're, they're wearing little bandanas or, visors over their the ridges yeah i mean you can uh, hide them super easy yeah they're gonna be there's gonna be so many interesting things done with that model those models excuse me and then for at the Warbringer titan that's coming in for i think it's just for 40k it's a new full-size titan yeah called the nemesis titan right he's another titan at this point for me anyway some of those titans are just eh it's another titan you hurt my soul. <laughs> well, this one has a giant cannon on his back, which kind of looks cool. See? You know why? Is is because I like my robots to have hands, and none of the Titans really have. Like, They're like, yeah, I've got gun emplacements. So I'm like, cool. Yeah. You look like a derpy T-Rex. Well done. <laughs> uh, with a giant cannon on the back. So anyway, oh, beautiful true. looking model. I'm sure that'll, that'll help some people. Yep. And then uh, while we're still in 40K, Chapter Approved got announced. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's going to be. They, they sort of sorry. previewed what was inside of it. We all knew it was coming, but they sort of previewed you're going to be able to build your own leaders now. Of course, the Sisters of Battle are going to be in there. So lots I mean, of different narrative things in there, it looks like. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And then my favorite part of Yay. the Vigilist stuff was Realm of Chaos, Wrath and Rapture. It's coming in December. Yes. So how excited am I of that? I don't know. It would depend on if you're playing Corn or Slanesh. So, uh, yeah. flesh hounds, flesh hounds, uh, realm of chaos, wrath and rapture. Karnak looks a little derpy, but I think that's just because you're trying to fit three heads on a on a beast. Yeah, um, it's going to happen to at least one of the heads at one point. There is a cool harpsichord player, really, for Slanesh. So it's a harp player. I didn't see it. Um, oh, it's it's beautiful. So it's just a a Slaneshi herald. Playing a harp. Nice. And the harp has uh, metal parts on it. The strings of the harp are sinew from muscles or wow. from the body that is making up the harp. At the oh, so oh, nice. I didn't catch that the first couple of times <laughs> I looked at it. And then you realize it's just a person with their arms flayed up, oh, um, head down. Yeah. That's Which awesome. for me is good because that means Games Workshop is not dumbing down the Slanesh stuff. You know, they're not, they're willing to go ahead and and make those changes and, and keep that darker side. I think we talked about that a while back, and we were wondering if they were going to, you know, work on other deadly sins instead of just... But nope, they're they're keeping that whole aesthetic going, which I think is actually... It's a gutsy call. I like it. I like it. It is. I see a lot of people complaining about the the demonettes and how they should get redone, and I'm like, you know what? They're, they are what they are. They're mm-hmm. there. And they're never not going to get redone because they're plastic. Right. And they're already made. Yeah, so they're already out there. So just fill the rest of your stuff with the kill cool stuff. Yeah. So exactly. But that was the Vigilus open day. Yeah, it was. And it was pretty, pretty weighty. Uh, you know, go to the Warhammer community site and look at what they talked about. It's there's a lot of stuff coming. I mean, granted, most of it is 40K, but, you know, we're going to see our stuff here shortly, too. Wow. It's cool. I'm so yeah, jazzed. Yeah, definitely. And it also looks like they had a bunch of a couple of cosplayers there as well. Yes. There's just some really cool pictures from the yeah. day as well. Yeah, definitely go check the site fun. out. So, so go check it out. And I think the last thing we'll do in New Dawn is we have to mention that Rob Symes, some of you may know him as Rufio. Um, he's the former presenter there on the Warhammer Twitch TV thing. He's the guy that won the South Coast GT and then helped them launch warhammer tv Mm -hmm. uh and he's since gone he's moved on and he started a channel on youtube twitch everywhere else called the honest war gamer well this week i believe thursday thanksgiving or was it earlier than that maybe it was sometime earlier this week he released a thing called the workbook i had to tweet right back to him that this is probably one of the best things i have seen come out for the game that wasn't from directly GW. This thing is amazing. And really what it is in a nutshell is it's a, I think, 17, 18 page PDF. And it covers how to make 
a list how to think about tournaments and how to think about all the stuff that goes around being a, a competitive AOS player. And I mean, it's from a guy that's won a few tournaments in his time and has spent a lot of time thinking about stuff like this. And I'll tell you what, reading through it opened my eyes to a lot of stuff. And I think it will, I think it will have an effect on anybody that plays at any level, really, in how to think about what kind of player you are and how to make a list that fits that. And it's absolutely awesome. It really is. I, you know, I, I skimmed through it. I've not had time to sit down with like an actual army and go through this, uh, but I think it's going to be beneficial. And it's not even if you want to win the tournament, because I think potentially that's what it's aimed at for the most part is people who are wanting to put that extra effort in to be ready to be able to play the game to a high level yeah. on there. The workbook is going to allow you to analyze what sort of play you're going to be playing, where the weaknesses are in your list, so that when you show up to the the game, you're not surprised right. as much. And it, you know, and it breaks it down. The the grind part three is something that I don't do enough. Yeah, um, getting practice games in, yes. really seeing the pack. It's funny at King of the Mountain this past weekend, uh, the amount of people that didn't read the pack. And got a surprise around about game two when they realized that the, the tournament was six games. Oh boy. And not five. So uh, that was oh, interesting. Yeah. So that's a that's a hell of a uh, thing to figure out late. I mean, that's right? a pack reading one oh one right there. Also, simultaneously with the release of the workbook, Rob also set up a website where you can throw up lists that you've worked on. And have people look at them, and you can put your rationale for the list. You can put a whole bunch of stuff in there about why you picked certain units, what you expect the army to do, how you think it's going to work. And then people can sit there and comment on it. They can upvote it. They can downvote it. So it can really turn into a resource where I don't want to say we'll just start netlisting, but for the person like me that's not good at figuring out whether or not a list will work, this workbook is huge and having the ability to put my list up there and have 10 people tell me why this isn't going to work or this will work. I mean, that's huge. That's going to be such a huge help. All I can say is Rob, you are amazing. And thank you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think the the website is great mainly because most of the time people post up a list and they're just like, Hey, what do you think of this list? Whereas the people that have taken the time and the effort to go through this, is what the list does Here's what the abilities do. Here's my thoughts around the strategy. Here's the other units that are just in the list, but not part of the bigger strategy. Yeah. I think the more we start to think about that sort of thing, um, we're going to be able to analyze and take a look at lists. And even if it's not, you want to copy the list, but you want to take parts of it yeah. out there and, and run with it. Yeah. You're going to know what it does rather than just going, okay, Rob ran a list and it looked really cool. So I'm going to make it. You know, I've been guilty of this. I've I've net listed in my, my time. So I take it and I go, okay, what can I do with this? Yeah. And then I've tried to play it and it went, actually, it's not going to work because mm-hmm. I don't play the same way as the person who who played it. Right. And that, that to me is the biggest part right there is seeing that person's rationale for why it works and why, what they expect it to do. That is, I mean, that's huge. I love it. We could, we could sit there and talk probably for a half hour on this, but really, honestly, mm-hmm. if you just go to the honest wargamer, all one word, dot com, you'll see what we're talking about. Get registered on the site and start looking at lists, and you'll see what, what the resource is all about. And, of course, you can download the workbook from that link as well. And when you read the introduction, you see one of the things he wants to do is just sort of establish a common framework in a common language where we're all talking about the same thing. When we talk about Alpha Strike, we're all talking about the same thing. When we talk about a bait unit, we're talking about the same thing. It's a really great thing, Rob. You, you did a hell of a service to the community there. Yeah, and he's been doing working with the Honest Wargamer now for just over a year. Yep. They, they yep. had their one-year anniversary, and so it's, it's really good to see that hard work and, and effort really pay off. He's been talking about this work week for a while, and so hopefully he can take that and build on it yeah move move forward with the honest wargamer on there yep, so i'm sure he will cool so yeah i think we're done with the new dawn and uh let's move on to the next realm <laughs> 
And now it's time for the realm of creation. We're going to talk about hobby stuff. And I'm going to lead off because Ryan's done more than I have. Because shortly after we finished recording the last episode, I closed my hand in the car door. And I messed up my index finger really bad. So I haven't really touched much <laughs> in the last like two weeks. So pardon the pun. Yeah, yeah. it's, <laughs> you know, of all the things, my index finger, any other finger, I would have still been able to paint and build stuff. But no, had to be the index finger. But I want to start off with this month's October, because um, there's a little lag time, uh, asset drop box that came in. And this one was super cool because as soon as I opened it, I squealed like, because the first thing I saw when I opened up this one was there was three bottles of the Turbo Dork uh, color shift paints. And I don't know if you've seen these color shift paints before. They're the ones that you lay down. And if you do it right, if you lay them down correctly, they actually do shift colors as you turn the model. Yeah, I've seen, I, I don't think I've seen that brand but I've seen the the green stuff world uh, one. Yeah. 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 I, they were, they seem to have been out a little bit earlier than people using them. Yeah. I, I can't honestly say who's better. I know there's a lot of people, especially online that were really jazzed about the turbo dark stuff. So yeah, to get three bottles of that was, Oh man, it's cool, but not to be outdone. Also in the box, they had some green stuff world, uh, wash inks. So they gave you some of their ancient sepia and some of their peccatum, peccatum flesh, which are both really cool washes and they're green stuff world washes so that you know they're going to be pretty good. I'm sorry, rounding out the box was some Humbrol paints, which are interesting because they gave you khaki matte, brown, yellow, and cream matte. So you can imagine this, that section was all designed around getting some flesh done. And also the big thing they talk about is sandstone. You can, if you follow the stuff in the pamphlet, it's all about sandstone. But if you also think about it, this can be really good flesh tones for paler type creatures. So it's going to oh, work nice. out really good. And then of course he spends the rest of the book talking about the color shift and how to put them on so that they work really well. It's not just slap, slap it on and then hope the light changes no it's it's you have to do it over you know a nice you want to do it over a glossy black i believe it's a glossy black primer coat and the thing is is to do it thin you can't lay it on thick you can brush paint it but you have to do it in thin layers and okay. same thing when you airbrush you have to just build up the layers and on the turbo dark site they've got a pretty good video about how to put it on and in the book of course he goes over it also so between the two of those resources, you should see what they're getting at. But other than that, the only thing I did was I painted three chain ra uh, spirit <laughs> hosts and I tried to do the Tyler Mengel method. Well, I did do the Tyler Mengel method and I'm really happy with how they came out. I was really excited to see them. I put a few of my own spins on it, but yeah, they looked really, really nice in the chat. So yeah, I need to put them up on the Facebook page. So because our yeah. chat isn't real available to everybody else. No, it's not. So, you are correct. Okay. Uh, so what'd you do? Well, so I had a tournament, so that meant three days before I was painting. Um, <laughs> as usual, I painted up two endless spells, the Everblaze Comet. Nice. And the Prismatic Palisade. And the Prismatic Palisade is not glued together because it fits in super snug. Yes. But what I did was I was able to Zenithal highlight it with the primer, and nice. then I just used washes. Uh, and dry brushes with the uh, glaze paints nice. and then put in a hard coat and it looked super cool. Nice. So, so you have all the different colors cool. on it? Yeah. Yeah. It goes through uh, blues, purples, oranges, yellows, and greens. And then when I put the hard coat on, it kind of melded it all together. So it looks, nice. looks super cool. I don't think it got used in a game, but um, it was done. And both of these spells were for Aventus Fire Strike to be used nice. in. Uh, our friend Gabe's ar ar army. Uh, so I also painted him. Beautiful model. Uh, so much detail. The wings are really nice to paint. There's probably about 300 to 400 feathers on each wing. Well, I know this because I was gonna say I'll I bet didn't no dry brush. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll bet nobody does those individually. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who with with uh, multiple layers and then washes and then and then you realize you want to paint white on one of them as well. <laughs> you know, because you're a masochist. Yeah, so so that was my painting. That was my creation. So I didn't actually finish Aventus. What I, I spent too much time on one of his wings to make him make it look really good. And because of the way the models actually put together, paint one wing at a time makes a lot of sense when you're putting that much detail into it. But it does mean that when you run out of time, one of your wings isn't painted. Oh, so well, um, it was painted to well above tabletop standard for the tournament. Just that one wing was a little bit off. So a little bit less yeah. than the other. Yeah. So we'll, I'm going to finish that off for Gabe, and then we'll get get pictures up on the site nice. uh, on the Facebook. And but we'll throw up pictures of the endless spells as well. Yeah, I want to see those. I want to see that uh, prismatic sphere or prismatic wall. Yeah, I think it came out really well, and yeah. it was super quick. That super sounds quick. like a really good idea, and I probably steal it from you. Yeah, totally. Everybody nice. can if you've not done it already. So mm-hmm. sweet. So that makes sort of a natural segue into the realm of battles, where you're going to talk about the King of the Mountain tournament, right? Sure. Right. Yes, I played games. All right, let's take a quick break, and then we'll we'll cover the games that you played. And I played Sounds game great. two. Just Ooh. wasn't AOS. <laughs> wow, look at this. Look at us go. I know, we're crazy. Double, doubling down. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's take a quick um. break. And now for the Realm of Battle, where we're going to talk about the games that we played we last recorded. Bill, why do you not take us off with your non-AOS games? That you played. Okay, it'll be super quick. What I did was get a chance to play Blackstone Fortress. And that is a really fun game. And I know it's fun because I played it with the wife. And it was one of those games that she said, well, let's keep going. Let's do another encounter because this is kind of fun. And I'm like, wow, that's that's almost unheard of. So, Wow, that's fun. Yeah, yeah that's good. definitely. Good game. Um, I mean, granted, it's 40K. So quick question on that, since uh, I don't have it, but I, I'm guessing you opened one of your many boxes so you <laughs> can keep one sealed. Um, yeah. uh, so it's Warhammer Quest, mm-hmm. right? So it goes into that. Does it have any of the same mechanics as the AOS version, or have they streamlined it, changed it? Obviously, it's going to have slightly different mechanics because it's it's – sci-fi rather than fantasy have you played the other games and how do you think it compares i've played all three versions and you know silver tower was the first one and it was really you know quite a sort of a linear adventure where you know you flip uh these cards and it told you what tile to put next and then you know you went through that tile and had encounters and fought baddies and it was a lot of fun don't i'm not trying to not trying to denigrate it but it was kind of uh almost railroady if you will you're going to go mm-hmm. through these levels it's going to be different every time so you're not going to get bored playing it it was kind of simple so when they came out with hammer hall it mm-hmm. added that element of having a game master in there sort of taking some of that you know the mechanical decision making away interjecting a real life person so that was a lot of fun this game takes it even a step further You can either have someone play the bad guys if you have five Mm -hmm. people or you can let the system run the bad guys. But there's a lot more options for the bad guys. They have a lot more reactions. And mechanically, it uses the same thing. You get a you get a card with your character on it. You get your stats and what you do. They sort of take the inspired mechanic from Shadow or or Warhammer Underworlds. So you can actually get your character inspired where everything gets a little bit easier and you get better at stuff, but it's still that thing where you roll four dice and then you use those to perform actions. The, the different part of it is, is once you start your encounter, you have an encounter deck of eight cards and four of which are going to be combat cards, four of which are going to be challenges. So as you go through each part of the game, you're not just doing the same old, okay, so we have to kill seven traitor guardsmen. Okay, now we have to kill five traitor guardsmen. <laughs> oh, now we have to kill four traitors. Guard- you know, it's not going to it's not gonna run down into something that boring. So I would say it has a really, really good mechanic in the campaign because the game is going to last you far more than one sitting. It's 
to to actually end the game, you have to defeat the four strongholds and then get to the secret vault and then face the challenges there. So, and it takes a while to find each vault. So this is not something you're just going to sit down in an evening and be done with. So it, it really is, it's a good game. But that being said, you can also play it in encounter mode where you can just play it one off for an evening. But they also have the mechanics yes. built into the game to where once you play it, then you put all your characters and all the stuff you've gotten in your gear. You put them in these little stasis chambers, i.e. Ziploc bags. And <laughs> well, let's, let's get to the chase here. Yeah, it really it makes for a great game because you pick up exactly where you left off. There's no question about, well, who had the, you know, the laser blaster of. Yeah, no. Everybody knows who's got what. So, yeah, it's a really good game. Mechanically, awesome. very, if you've played one of the others, you will jump right into this. It's not, it's not crazy hard. There's a couple of different mechanics that you have to look out for, but nothing is going to be like completely changing the way you play Warhammer Quest. So, good game. Awesome. Cool. I just wondered mm-hmm. if they just continued to build, which it sounds like they have. Yeah. Super cool. They're refining the system, and, and I hope this kind of a system sort of works its way into the fantasy setting because it works well. So anyway, what about the tournament? I want to hear. I want to Okay. So the tournament, uh, two dare, six games, much to the confusion of the people that didn't read the pack, but six games up in Castle Rock. So this is the end of the tournament season for the, the campaign pretty much ran by Rob and Chad up in, in Castle Rock, up in Denver area. So everybody got points throughout the year. A little bit like the ITC, but just for the region. Um, so we we had a few players. There was sickness running rampant. Oh, That's no. one thing that I would say. We did have a few drops due to people just being sick. Oh, um, man. Yeah, so the second day was a little bit quieter, but the first day, uh, everybody was there. Everybody was ready to go. I took uh, Shannon's Dragon Force, so two Dragon Lord Battalions. I changed it a little bit to make it mixed order so that I could get in the Tenembro Shard <laughs> with the Blade of Judgment. And uh, we'll recap what he did near the end. Oh, this good. So, um, <laughs> quickly run through my games. Uh, we won't go turn by turn. I'll just point out anything fun that that really happened uh so game one was against will hodges and his moon clan i hadn't played against moon clan uh probably since early eighth edition actually uh back in the world that was wow so That's a it was kind of, we had on this this table there was a giant fort wall that went halfway down the the table and we were playing uh taking hold yeah that stopped any goblins getting to me i just flew over it and uh charged oh. in his army oh no and took things off <laughs> i will say that netters are annoying with their minus one to hit but <laughs> the table didn't favor for will no so, probably not yeah that and colossal squigs do a lot of damage when they get to hit things so that was fun um so that was my game one my game two was against jeff geode who spoilers went on to take take the tournament playing ideneth deepkin this game was all right uh we were playing away um, my dice were super hot for the first two turns, <laughs> and then Jeff won. <laughs> so we'll just we'll just go there. Just leave it yeah, at that. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff just won. My third game was against um, Mike uh, Trujillo, and he was playing Ideneth Deepkin, and uh, he put almost all his army up into the into the Ether Sea, and I thought it was being all you know smart and tactical by blocking off three sides of the board. So you can bring them on, not realizing they had taken a certain enclave that extended the range Oops. that you could bring things on. So he brought stuff on. Um, I did win that game. It was very tough once all the eels came on and killed a bunch of dragons. Oh, yeah. So Yeah, but that was a fun game. I was thinking it was being all tactical and, and great. Even turn one, I charged uh, my dragon with the doppelganger cloak into his eels. But it was the only combat that i had so i had to attack with them and he put uh and these were defensive eels not the offensive ones oh boy. and they still put eight wounds on my dragon so wow and that was turn one so that dragon didn't last long but, um, um. but that also started my blowing fire at people and doing one mortal wind oh. which was a theme of the the tournament oh no um <laughs> yeah apparently dragon fire is just one mortal wound Apparently it can go up to D6, but even that D6 will be a one. So 
Um, <laughs> I learned that throughout the day. So uh, day one, I was on two wins and one loss, and I was feeling pretty good about that, the army that I'd picked something that was fairly competitive. I thought I was taking a knife to a gunfight, so I was kind of pleased with that. Yeah, I would um, be. So day two, I actually, first game was against Gabe. So travel for six hours and get to play the guy that lives 45 minutes down the road, um, <laughs> which was actually good. You know, I had helped Gabe write his list and then proceeded to know all the weaknesses, beat it. I, I'd like to say it was that simple, but it was really the scenario, which was places of arcane power. So I had a lot more artifacts and wizards in my list. And um, so Gabe was playing Phoenix Temple and he also failed to cast his two spells turn one you rolled oh. a five and a four to cast his spell so oh boy that would have changed things yeah. for sure but that hurt yeah so that was that was game four game five uh i played against stormcast eternals uh in the one where they can't teleport and so what? i was super excited <laughs> yeah well not that they can't teleport that they can i think it's total commitment right the name of it so he set up on one of his objectives with four celestar ballistas a lord ordinator so i decided i wasn't going for that one probably a good and idea went for the other one which had a prime well basically the rest of his army over that side and this was the first game that i decided to alpha strike with the dragons rather than using their move to just get around the board so i alpha struck didn't do enough wounds and my army disappeared um Ow. pretty much yeah so again uh, so there was special secondary scenario cards that people wanted to get and one of them was the bomb so you picked a mm-hmm. character a hero and when they got into when they ended their move in the de- deployment zone of your enemy they blew up <laughs> uh, doing d6 moral damage moral wounds to everybody within six um <laughs> So I stopped him just outside it and then charged in and I thought I'd measured it so that it wouldn't hit in my guys. Apparently that was not the case. Oop. I did a bunch of damage, mainly killing a couple of my units um, or models from my units, doing some damage to my dragons. And then it came to the prime. So D6 more wound, right? Right. So that's got to be at least, oh yeah, one mortal wound. Oh, well, yeah. On mm-hmm. there. So then I'm like, okay, dragon fire. 2d3 shots of dragon fire into him. Should get at least so four. We're at, nope, we're now up to three mortal wins Ooh. from all three of those attacks. The Prime didn't die, and then the Prime killed the rest of the army. My one fun thing that happened in that game was he started coming after my objective, which I had some Glade Guard sitting on, and the Glade Guard open fired and killed the Lord Celestine on a Dragoth. So I was like super excited. How in um, the hell did they do that? They get one turn of uh, minus three damage. Uh, sorry, minus three rend. Oh, that's right. Yeah, rend three. Um, so he had taken a few wins from the combat with uh, with the dragon, uh, but he still had three or four left. And they shot and hit and took out his, his, his windage with nice. that. So I was super happy about that because he was literally three inches away, ready to charge and kill them. Oh, and boy. they're like, nope. Yeah, let I'm- me just shoot you. So that was a loss there. So day two, winning a loss, going into the last game, and I get to play Jeremy Garcia with his Order Draconis. So uh, his one was three dragons and six units of uh, dragon blades. So he went pure Order Draconis. Right. And this one was shifting objectives. So I, and you know, he had three battalions, so I knew all three dragons could just scoot across the board and wipe me out. Yeah. And so I, I played super defensively. And let's see things that happened in this game. Uh, he won it on objectives. A couple of things learned in this game. So remember, this is game six of the tournament, and I, this is when I find out that when dragon blades and also your <laughs> uh, guy with the lance on the dragon charge, not only do they get plus one to wound, they also get plus one damage. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, so would have been helpful for five games before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So re- read your War Scrolls, people. <laughs> read your War Scrolls. <laughs> we, this was actually a super tight game. Uh, went back and forth. I was up. He was up. The primary objective moved around. So we, we went back and forth on points. We played out a very quick turn four, including me thinking I could maybe get it um, just enough. So I charged my dragon into his dragon on the objective. And I'm like... 
okay if i do another combat first i've got the doppelganger cloak you'll have to activate then i can hit you kill you maybe take the objective be up on points the doppelganger cloak i thought was just that can't be hit until activated that turn the wording is can't be attacked until they've made attacks this turn right now because we had two doppelgangers in combat and nothing else that dragon couldn't attack because it couldn't put any attacks on my dragon which oh. had it and so my dragon couldn't put any attacks on him oh no um, so we just sat there standing around <laughs> uh which meant i couldn't take that objective which meant um he was able to take it uh. which was which was, was rough but hey ho it, it, it was a great game great opponent great fun and overall i had great fun with the, the army it was a it, it was a fun list. It wasn't too. I mean, the dragons when they did what they were supposed to do, which was very rarely, were fun, <laughs> and they, they were super powerful. The rest of the tournament was, and um, just some fun games, which is what I wanted. Yeah. when I went up there. Well, that's um, cool. Yeah. So the Chambro shard. So I gave him the the sword of judgment, which is a in my, pretty nice sword. Yeah, it is. It does D six more wins. Yeah. On a six, but when you do his teleport ability, he gets plus one, so it's fives and sixes. So firstly, let me explain that he teleported three times out of 30 turns of Age of Sigmar. <laughs> um, he killed two models over the course of the tournament. Oh, my God. He killed Aventus Firestrike. Oh, that's um, something. When he was already on three wins from the dragon beating on him. And he also killed... On his own, an 80-point Grot Shaman. In two of my games, so two out of six games, <laughs> he didn't teleport at all. So that means over 10 dice rolls, I couldn't roll a 4+. plus. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. And I had been silly with him because I wanted to keep him alive to do the teleporting. Sure. He was always just in a back corner, just sitting there. Yeah. So he was 80 points down. Pretty much yeah. for the entire game, just sitting there. And an artifact on on this guy that wasn't doing anything. So, he, yeah, he might get dropped from the list, I think. No. Um, I'm not too <laughs> sure. But, you know, and I was all super excited when I went to the tournament. I was like, okay, let's see what this guy can do. I'm super excited. Okay, this is my ga- game. My game for the tournament is what can this guy kill? Yeah, he went to uh, Matalan of the Storm or the Sea and just didn't kill him. And uh, he did the same with Volturnus. He did seven wins rather than eight. Um, and in that game, my opponent got super salty over the fact that Dragon Breath is not a ranged attack or a missile attack. Right. So, and I realized that, and that was game three that I realized that. And when I was able to retreat from combat, run to get in range and do that last wound to Volturnus Ooh. with my Dragon Breath. Because it's just an ability. Yeah, so he died. But then the rest of his army took me out. So, yeah, so overall, great, <laughs> great event. Ran pretty much on time. A little delay on, on the Saturday getting started. But we were done. We were cleared up by Sunday at about 6, 6.30. So, nice. yeah, it was great fun. Shout out to all my opponents that were, that were fun to play with. Also, shout out to, hey, you won't mind me sharing this, but friend of the show, uh, Randy Salt Hill. Um <laughs> He uh, was playing a game with his dreams, his Seraphon, mm-hmm. against Fire Slayers and did over 47 wins in one combat to a unit of uh, just basic battle line Fire Slayers. So he did 40, 47 damage going through, did zero damage oh after God. their saves. Did 47 hits and no wounds. Uh, he did 47 hits and 47 wins. And then uh, Levi, mean Levi Bennett, saved every single one of them. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Randy must have been fit to be tied. He did. He, he, was, he walked away from the table a little bit, he regaling us with the story, and I just laughed. Um, across oh, my God. And was like, did you bring me joy? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was a fun. Oh, fun, that's killer. Uh, one time of random dice rolls that will probably never happen again. But <laughs> if it was going to happen to anybody, it would happen to Randy. It would happen so, to Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that hurts. Yeah. So thanks again to Rob and Chad for putting that on. You're running the whole series too. I mean, that's 
Yeah, and they basically run most of the events as well for the series uh, up there in Denver and Castle Rock. So big thank you to the work that they've done in the 2018-2017 season. They are going to take a little bit of break from running events uh, so they can actually play in them. No, that's good. Uh, which is fair enough. So they're still going to run their, their doubles tournament and then hopefully King of the Mountain again. They're not going to run the three, four, five different events that they've run this year. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that, that's uh, got to get tiresome. So. Yeah. Here's to everybody else in the the mountain region. Put on some, some events. Yeah. Get them registered with Rob and Chad and uh, come along to what's a really a great event. Yeah. So. Heck yeah. I like it. So that about cool. rounds out the battle then, right? It does indeed. Yes. We'll take a super quick break and we'll be back with Azir and Shamo. Shamo. Okay. So now, as we said at the top, we're going to get back to our realm overviews and we're going to start off with one of the most populated and yet boring realms, the realm of Azir. And this one's kind of, I don't know boring in a big way it's yeah i mean so i think the reason it's boring or can be seen as boring the fighting was done in the age of myth right in the age of chaos by the time you get to the age of sigmar the only fighting that happens in uh, azir actually happens in the soul wars book yeah where uh, and that's because a spirit gets out yeah and goes nuts yeah, it's a it's a miscue because of the the necroquake. So yeah, uh, outside of that, there's very little fighting that goes on. I mean, I as far as I can understand, there's still maybe some orcs and maybe some beastmen, but there's no background to really state that that's true. Yeah, so exactly, truly, it's it's Sigmar's realm and it's been walled off and isolated for pretty much the entire Age of Chaos. So yeah, there's mm-hmm. not going to be. A lot going on. There's a few notable places. The big palace city, which is Sigmaron, which is, you know, all gold, sweetness and light. Um, Of course, the Sigmarabulum is out there. That's the Forge of the Six Smiths. That's where the Stormcaster made. And if you really want to get a great overview of that process, read the beginning of Soul Wars. Exactly. It's amazingly well described. Yeah, so much so that one of the guys that's been part of the Sacrosanct chamber you know he's sitting outside but you can hear the difference Mm -hmm. between the uh, i think it was actually one of the more important uh, stories actually you could hear the difference between the different uh six smiths yeah uh, hammer strikes Mm -hmm. which is nuts but it's also maybe that you you would be able to identify which of the smiths the flaw is coming from um, right which would be kind of cool yeah malice is up there yeah you know that's huge it's it's sitting uh, just up there. What I didn't realize was that that's where uh, Sigmarite is actually mined from. Yeah, that's where they get all the uh, Sigmarite is from the, the remains of Malice that Dracothian pulled over. I'm glad that Malice seems to be more of a thing now. You know, it's getting mentioned a little bit more and more as they're linking back to the realm that, or the world that was. Yeah. Um, which is super cool. Yeah. Yeah, they pushed out some... Uh, some chaos from there when they first showed up. Right. There's a couple of uh, lodges there for the fire slayers. Right. Y- you know, you do have the fantastic beasts and where to find them yes. is apparently in his ear. <laughs> well, yeah. So you've got Dracos, Dracolines, Star Drakes, uh, Griffhounds. You've got all the different types of birds that yeah. they're using, the yeah. Torlons. They're all from the mountains yeah. um, of his ear. But you're right. It got shut down, right? Yeah. You know, when, when Sigmar went back there and he didn't open those gates until very recently. So mm-hmm. though, um, yeah, nothing was opened until the very beginning of the realm gate wars. So yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been isolated for, well, the entire age of chaos, really. Yeah, exactly. And um, since, you know, they're not going to do any fighting in that realm, it's pretty much underdeveloped or not. I don't want to say underdeveloped. It's undeveloped because there's really no need to go there. I don't think, you know, in their GW's estimate, there's really no need to flesh that area out because if the fighting comes to Azir, it's probably over for the Mortal Realms. Yeah, I think we might see, because I know Skaven are able to gnaw in there. 
So the skate the skaven have been able to to bypass the realm gates and yeah. maybe get into the the city. So what we might see further down the line is a little bit of fighting in here, putting Sigmar on the back foot. But I think that's a long way away. In yeah. all honesty, I really um, do. As you say, wait until end times age of Sigmar, um, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Um, oh God, let's not start that yet. <laughs> no, no, it's funny. Yeah, so this is where the anvil of apotheosis is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really all that I can think of. Yeah, I for mean, what's here. So it's it's where it's where Stormcast hang out. Yeah. So NASA is <laughs> kind of boring. No, I mean, uh... <laughs> there's a really bright star. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, really, what we ought to do is move into the realm of battle rules for Azir. Oh yeah. wait. <laughs> so I was just thinking about this, but we we're talking about it, right? So there's no realm of battle rules, right? Because you're never going to fight there. There's no magic, right, from there because you're never going to fight there. Mm-hmm. But what is interesting is there isn't any artifacts from Azir, right? And that that is kind of strange that there's no spell lore or, like you said, artifacts of so, Azir. Yeah, so when it comes to playing a battle, right, you would only have the spell lore if you were fighting there. So that makes sense that there's nothing there. Sure. But it also makes it sound like there's no artisans, no blacksmiths, no no people making any artifacts from that realm. Well, I think what they assume is that all the stuff that the Stormcast are running around with sort of replaces mm-hmm. all that stuff. Hey, you know, that's that's everyday life for them. They're cranking this stuff out so that every third storm cast has a grand hammer or, you know, two out of every five has a, a grand hammer and every odd yeah. sequitur has a, a grand mace, you know? So I, I imagine that it's sort of factored already in that you're, you're not going to base an army in his ear. That's the realm of the storm cast and get over it. Yeah. That makes, makes sense. I just, yeah, you, you've kind of hit the nail on the head. Their realm artifacts are basically in the storm cast big. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's kind of the way I took it with that. We can, I think we can kind of wrap up Azir because there's really nothing game wise to talk about. You're not going to fight there. You're not going to get stuff from there. So let's the, go somewhere cooler. Well, I don't know if it's cooler. <laughs> see, but I uh, open the door for you to walk that's, right that's through. See what you did there. <laughs> uh, it's definitely shinier. Oh, yeah. In places. So Shimon, the realm of metal. Oh, is yeah. Is where we're going to go next. Notable things just off the top of my head without. Uh, any research on this uh, uh-uh. would be the fact that uh, this is where Sigmar lost Galmaraz and where it was held by Zinch, and Zinch nearly took over the entire realm. That's right. Well, yeah, you know, that would be in the, like the greatest hits of Shimon right there. Well, there's <laughs> there's more too because in the in the Age of Myth, Shimon is where Sigmar found Grimnir and Grungni chained yep. to the highest summit. Blah blah blah. The other thing that makes Shaman interesting is when Grungni was creating the 19 wonders of Shaman. Well, yep. his exertions, his hot breath was what created all the ether gold that becomes very, very important to a certain faction that we all know and sort of love because they look good and all. So this is where the, the ether gold comes from. The mythology of ether gold is it's Grungni making all these amazing artifacts in Shaman. And when he was breathing out because it was tiring, he was spitting out ether gold. It's one of those things is, is it true? Is it not right? This is the age of myth. You know, we see gods roaming around in the age of Sigmar, but we've not seen Grungi. But, you know, is there that kernel of actual truth or is ether gold just naturally occurring? Right. Eh. Um, That's where it's in, you know, I I like the mythology aspect of it. I think that's kind of cool. They, yeah, they yeah, make me you too. wonder. But then Grungi just leaves his people. Yeah. Completely. Bye. And he decides to go and help the Pantheon in order and starts to uh, make the Sigmarabulum. Yeah. I mean, you would think he would have called it something to do with him. Yeah. Other than just Sigmar. But hey ho. I feel like that's been the like, that's been renamed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh dwarves are the best of them. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, that might have that might have not got over well with the rest of the pantheon. <laughs> yeah, maybe not, maybe not. But it would have been funnier. Gork um, and Mark would have been like, "Oh, <laughs> oh um, Lord." What else have we got 
on here. So uh, we do have Shamanite is actually the realm stone, yep. the Shimon. And so that started to get mined mm-hmm. by Dwarden. And that um, led to all kinds of problems. As always, right? Yeah. Well, because that's um, what attracted Zinch to Shimon was all of the uh, Shamanite, which was mm-hmm. shiny. So naturally, Zinch liked it because he's kind of a bird. That's when things just started to go really downhill for the dwarves. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. They they did have a a quick god beast, the Lord Griffin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they needed I something else to, to go wrong, you know. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I mean, Argentine is also they're just burning liquid metal constantly, so that's always fun. Yeah, you don't want many god beasts showing up, especially yeah. when Zinch is trying to take over your realm. You right? know, in that original set of books. That whole discussion about Argentine and how it was his fire that kept the molten lake flowing and making the big waterfall that went down to the other section of the realm. I just thought when I started reading that, I was thinking to myself, wow, they have left Warhammer Fantasy way behind because this is off the hook. Right. They, they really brought in the, the high fantasy. Oh, yeah okay, this is just a, a weirdness. And that's when we used to have, I think we've gotten away from it, those really artistic drawings of what the realms are, right? You've got the hanging valleys yeah, there where it's just the, the picture of a quick dragon and then a bunch of liquid metal yeah. that goes down. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just a lot of that stuff is just so evocative of you're not in, you know, Britonia anymore, buddy. Nope. But there could be Britonia somewhere. Could be. Just uh could be it's probably far away from the realm stone. <laughs> That's just why I think the further you get away from that realm stone, the more mundane it happens. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is where the Stormcast find Galmaraz again. You can get it back. Yeah. That's a good story. Yeah, in the Age of Sigmar era, you have a lot of things that happen. There's an Eldritch Fortress of Ephrix, which was discovered by the Stormcast Eternals. And it actually forced the sorcerer that was running the fortress to unleash its power to uh, annihilate all of them. And the storm hosts were all destroyed and sent back to Azir. But because he used so much power, it actually led to some of them seeing a vision of Gal Moraz inside that fortress. And so, needless to say, a pretty large-scale attempt was made to uh, get that thing back. And as we all know... There's a whole book dedicated to that, and uh, the Stormcast good guys do get Galmaraz back. That makes Shimon a very, a reasonably important realm, and there's other things that make Shimon very important as well, and we'll cover that when we get to the Realm Gates shortly. In the Age of Sigmar time frame, one thing that is huge is that all of the Karadran Overlord, the main skyports, are all located in Shimon. So, you know, all the ones you know and love, Beric Zilfin, Beric Thring, Beric Nar, all of those, they're all in Shimon. Because that's where the, the, the Aether Gold is. Yeah, and so it makes yeah. sense to have all the powerful ones there. It's also when they were first hinting at what was up in the skies. I remember it. I can't remember which book, but one of the Realm Gate War books where they're walking through and they see glints in the sky. And you're like, oh, what's up there? What's up there? And then it turned out to be dwarves. Yeah. And you're like, what? Or Dwarden. Yeah. Um, you're like, yeah. why, why are Dwarden up there? Yeah. <laughs> um, Flying dwarves? So, this can't be right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that was truly the first, again, a, another big part of making Age of Sigmar what, what it is, right? Is uh, shaking off the shackles yeah. almost to the, the world that was and going, okay, dwarves, where were they normally? Under the ground. Yeah. Traditionalists, where are they now? Well, they're up in the sky. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, cool. I can, I can dig this. Yeah. And it is true. You know, love them or hate them. The Caradron Overlord book was really the first one that blew the doors off of old time fantasy. I, mm-hmm. you know, the Sylvaneth had all new units and, you know, different ways of playing and all that stuff, but they were still wood elves and, you know, they were still kind of, they had their roots in the ground, if you'll pardon the pun, but the Caradron overlords just blew the doors off of it and pretty much told everybody that there's nothing we won't do in this new world. So that was yeah. really, I mean, to me, this was an eye opener. The The KO book was an eye opener. I mean, I know it didn't turn out to be what everybody thought, but it was certainly the eye opener. 
So um, yeah, some notable been. realm gates, and that's one of the things in Shaman. There's a lot of realm gates that are pretty well documented in Shaman, which it's going to lead to this place being a battleground for a while. And the guy that Zinch controls most of Shaman. So there is a constant battle going on with the forces of Zinch. Of course, Beric Urbaz, one of the Karadran Overlord city or skyports, has a bunch of different secret realm gates that are hinted at. Why would you mention them, right? Yeah. You're going to, the other skyports could probably, you know, then be like, okay, kill. Cool. Yeah, yeah. The, that's how they're, they're making sure they're getting their money, even though they're not quite the highest, but they are the market city, right? Yeah. So Makes there's sense. probably just little ones dotted mm-hmm. around for them to run around. Yeah. So the big one in Shaman and the most important one for to be fought over, I think anyway, is called the Silver Way. And it's a hidden realm, hidden realm gate in Envrock, and it's made out of quicksilver or mercury, if you will. Uh, and it can connect Shaman to any of the other realms when the proper incantations are incanted. It's also a one-way portal. So because it's formed out of Quicksilver, as soon as you travel across it, it sort of disappears behind you. So that makes it an incredibly big strategic resource for both sides, really. Yeah, I mean, it's a one-way trip, right? So potentially you could trick people into going mm-hmm. through it and they're, they're miles away, which is very Zinchian. I think, you know, the Mercurial Gate, is going to be probably one of the most important ones because that one oh, yeah. goes to the all points. All points, yeah. And you can come back from it, yeah. which is nice. Yeah. Silverway is nice for doing those uh, one-way raids, you know. Just whoever has that is going to have the ability to just, oh, I don't know, mess some things up. So, yeah, but the one that goes to all points, that's that's the one you want to you wanna get a hold of. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like the Storm to Cast have that big a uh, foothold in this realm either. You know, it's not is solidified as it would be in, say, Ashi or Gairan, sorry. Yeah, Gairan. This realm is hard to nail down because, you know, the way everything is always transformative, everything's moving, everything's shifting. It's It's got to be a it's got to be a pain to do the strategical part of figuring out how to take this realm back because something that's there today might not be there tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I do find that... I just saw this little tidbit where uh, when the Stormcast did come down and came in, their storm basically disrupted the the, the overlords. And the, when they were trying to mine some Aether Gold, so they start freaking out and um, like trying to mine it really quickly <laughs> before the storm disrupts the, the plans and makes it disappear. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's one of the, so it's, it's probably the fourth biggest or most in depth looked at realm. Yeah. Outside of the the other three, uh, and that's up until recently, it was probably in the top three. Oh yeah, uh, until we started looking at death a little bit more. Yeah, but it's definitely yeah, you know, it's it's a really cool place. Something that we've never seen. That's right. Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things in there that we've never seen before. The megalophon, a giant shark. Yeah, hunting the skies. <laughs> um, you know, we first started hearing about that. Generally, this one is really hard to. From a modeling point of view, it's really hard to get across, I feel, unless you're just painting things metallic. Yeah. Uh, um, you could cop out and just, you know, put lead belter all over everything and call it <laughs> metal. But, I mean, there's just so many different ways to approach this. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm actually kind of looking forward to it. I'm trying to do one of the realm gates for each of the realms now. And I oh, think nice. I have an idea for this one, but I got to see how it works out because I have those new Badger Metalsmith paints. And Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Nice. I kind of want to do like you were talking about the prismatic sphere, you know, like a rainbow look. But with metallics? Yeah. That that could work really well, actually. It could be cool. Uh, So I'm going to see if I can carry it off or if if I just botch it. (laughs) And this kind of takes us on to the uh, actual gaming side. Yes. So the the Realm of Battle, Shimon, the Realm of Metal. Mm -hmm. So if we just touch on the Realmscape features, and then we can touch on the command and and magic. But the the Realmscape features really lead into this conversation, right? What does it look like? Yeah. The number one on the dice. Ooh, I get this one. (laughs) Yeah, you can. How how is that, Bill? Well, it has no effect. (laughs) It has no effect. It's also description is just smooth. Yeah. <laughs> it, like brushed steel. Yeah. Probably not a great one for your bases, no. but maybe. 
<laughs> but you'll fall off because it's really smooth. Yeah. All right. You want to uh, take number two? Number two, iron trees. So the bark on the trees in this region is made of metal. Who would have thought? Rather than <laughs> one. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that worsens the rent by one to a minimum of zero if right. you're in the Citadel Wood. Um, then what's interesting with that is Citadel Woods uh, it should um, block line of sight. So that'd be something hitting you without line of sight, or even if you're in combat in those woods. Uh, you know, the woods are making the, yeah. the effort there. So Yeah, I mean, I've had that more than once where I had to take my beast claw and come up to the side of the woods and try to reach in and beat people up. So interesting cool. idea. So number three yeah. is the rust plague. The terrain of this land has been infected with a plague that can cause armor to turn to rust in mere moments. So at the start of the hero phase, you roll a die on a six up. You pick an enemy unit that is in cover. Subtract one from save rolls made for that unit for the rest of the battle. This is one of those that it's every hero phase and it's each person since this is a realmscape feature. So mm -hmm. pretty soon, you know, in a, in a five turn game, five of your units are going to have their, uh, well, on a six plus, but potentially yeah. five of your units are going to have some pretty bad saves. So it's going to be that, that one turn where you're like, okay, I'm good. I'm in here. And you're like, nope, you no, no longer get that cover. Yeah. It's not Enjoy. good anymore. It doesn't say you cannot select the same unit twice. So yeah, so you if you're lucky enough to roll a six twice, yeah, you can you can do it, right? Yep. I think uh, I like the idea of this though, from a table point of view, from a realm point of view of mm -hmm. just that there's these trees or you know the the rocks and stuff like that, just with this massive this. I imagine just this is a area in Shimon where it's just slowly spreading out, where yeah. it's just this really bad rush, right? Dark and rust in the middle, and then just fresher stuff all the way through. It's kind of cool. Yep. Um, the next one, Steel Rain. So the cold gray clouds in the skies above the battlefield can suddenly unleash a hail of steel rain. Well, that sounds dangerous. And I think it is. So at the start of your hero phase, roll a dice on a six plus. Pick an enemy unit that is not in cover. Uh, roll a dice for each model in that unit. Inflict one more wound for each roll that is less than the unit save characteristic. A save characteristic of dash counts as a six for the purposes of this roll. Yeah, that's kind so, of rude. Yeah, suddenly, well, it would make uh, rain seem very frightening in this this realm for sure. You're like, oh, what's the what's the weather forecast for today? Well, it'd be sunny with scattered showers of steel rain. Yeah, or you may die. So, and you um, know. Granted, this is on a six plus, but if you catch a big unit, say, you know, 40 chain wraps, 30 plague bearers, you know, something like that out in the open, mm -hmm. man, you could potentially devastate that unit in just one turn. Yeah. It, it yeah. Is, that's crazy. Something lightly armored, witch elves. Yeah. I mean, they have their other saves, even fire slayers a little bit. You know, even if you only take out half the unit, that's still on a random six. Yeah. It's going to be nice. Yeah, that's huge. Help. Huge. Um, okay, so number five is Brittle Isles. This region is so cold that weapons may shatter when they strike against the target's armor, making well-protected opponents much more difficult to harm. So for the effect of this one is ignore the Ren characteristics of all weapons for the duration of this battle. <laughs> you talk about just a slap in the face. Oh my gosh. Everybody becomes a night haunt. Have fun. Exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, it's even better than that because you ignore Ren, but you still can do stuff like uh, Mystic Shield or Being right. Cover. Right. I think it, you know, it's a bit harsh on Beasts of Chaos, where one of their abilities is yeah. minus one Ren. For some people, that would just be nuts. Yeah. Right? You, you Stormcast, super strong when they're running around in there. So, yeah. Wow. And the last one, Irresistible Force. Zinch covets the realm of metal and his interference sometimes makes spell casting more effective. <laughs> oh joy, but also more dangerous. So if a cast roll is a double after rerolls, but before modifiers are applied, it is successful, even if you rolled less than the value, and cannot be unbound. Mm. After the effects of the spell have been carried out, each unit within three inches of the caster suffer a mortal wound. So 
It's almost like the old irresistible force that we used to have. Super cool. Some of these are you're just not going to see as much. No. In competitive play, but or match play, sorry. Yeah. But I think you know both of these have a bunch of wizards. It'd just be kind of cool. It'd be yeah. Okay, we're basically playing in Zinchu's realm. Let's try and cast a bunch of magic at each other. Oh, and yeah, things are going to cr- get crazy. So what kills me yeah, is, no. you know, the in this realm, the number three and the number four results are, you know, they're on a six up. So they could be devastating, but they're not going to happen that often. Whereas five is one of those. OK, it just slaps everybody and with a huge, huge penalty to everybody. And then the number six one, this one, the irresistible force is just like, OK, go ahead and play your magic. Just imagine if yeah. you're fighting, you know, Zinch on Zinch or something. It's just going to get nuts. <laughs> nuts. Well, I think I think five is really good for people that don't have rent anyway. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, you ignore rent. Well, now so do I. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mentioned Stormcast there as a, a benefit because they don't get hit by rent, right. but it's also negative. It's, you know, some of their weapons are really high rent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, even just around what rent one, you know, or rent two and things suddenly is making those things with a, a worse save even better. Now, let me see. We have the magic and the command. Which one do you want to do? Yeah, let's go with the magic since we're talking about Zinch okay. on there. So first one is transmutation of lead is what you, you get. So that's the realm sphere magic, not the, the magic list right. that we'll touch on in a second. Yeah. But it's casting value is seven, so a little bit higher than normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it's cast, pick an enemy unit within an 18 inch of the caster that's visible to them until your next hero phase half the move characteristic uh, of the unit that you picked rounding up. In addition, if the unit has a save characteristic of 2, 3, or 4 plus, then until your next hero phase, you can re-roll uh, hit rolls of 1 for attacks made against that unit. Yep. So, yeah, it just makes their, their armor. Yeah. Lead. It's kind of cool. I like it. It's not too overpowering, I don't think. I think it could have an impact. You know, when so- someone's trying to move somewhere, I think the movement part is definitely a huge thing. Yeah, this is going to be like a fun thing to cast on, say, a Star Drake or any of the Stormcasts that move fast. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this will definitely hold them up in their tracks and make them a little bit easier to hit because all that gleaming gold just turned to a rock. So, yeah, or even, uh, Things like witch elves, mm-hmm. you know, that can run and charge. Yep. Suddenly they're moving two and a, or three inches rather than five, which is it's huge. Yeah. It really is. Yep. And, and again, where movement is so key. Right. Or even these things that have big move move ranges, right? You know, the dragons, for example, that I was running this weekend would be down to movement seven rather yeah. than 14. Yeah. Which is, That's is massive. Yeah. So, so it's a good spell. Yeah, I so. like it. Yep. So how about the command ability? Well, the command ability for this realm is called Adapt or Die. Warriors in the realm of metal quickly learn to adapt and evolve as the lands shift and meld. A wise general knows to harness this resilience and use it to ensure victory. Hmm, Sounds cool. So you can use this command ability at the start of your hero phase. If you do so, pick a friendly unit within three inches of a friendly hero or 12 inches of your general. Until your next hero phase, roll a die each time you allocate a wound or mortal wound to a win- to a model in the unit that you picked on a 6-up, the wound is negated. So basically, it's a 6-up death save. Yeah, um, which is always great, right? Yeah, it's pretty good, but you know, when you look at some of the command abilities that are out there for... I mean, if you don't have something like this at your disposal, then this would be huge. Like, if you're playing a Seraphon army, I don't believe this is duplicated anywhere in the Seraphon command abilities. So no, it'd be kind of nice not. to have. It's it's just a bubble effect, right? Yeah. Which is, is kind of nice. I think, I think if you don't have strong uses for your command points... Mm-hmm then this is where you could just throw that out there. Right. Um, you know, I took a, a wizard, an archmage on a horse, and that was one of his spells. Oh, I nice. Trying to cast that. So um, in super resilient lists like uh, Gabe's Phoenix, it would just be even more annoying. Yeah. So, you know, his general could have a, a two plus armor save followed by a four plus damage save followed by a six plus damage save followed by another 
So he's most damage saved. So, Jeez. you know, witch elves again. Yeah. Super frustrating um, to get through that. So definitely has its uses. And I can see it being super frustrating to, to play against if you're not using those points elsewhere. So that pretty much ties up the realm features of Shaman. So if you're playing a game in Shaman, those are some of the things you can look forward to. So what would you like to move on to next? Either the spells or the artifacts of Shaman? Yeah, let's pop to the spells and then we can just pick our our favorite and our least favorite. And then we can get to the the weapons and artifacts and do the same thing. Wrap this this realm up, so to speak. Okay, so the spells of Shimon. Mm-hmm. We got six spells. Some of them you may remember, uh, <laughs> wording wise, oh, yeah. from the world was, but they're very much attacking, making things harder to move, or making things slow down, uh, slow down, or yeah. affecting armor saves and things like that. Right. So definitely, there's a theme here, a utility thing, mm-hmm. rather than actual damage. Yep, I think that's that's the the feeling that I get through it. Um, uh, I actually like Rain of Lead mixed in with the Transmutation of Lead that we just had mm-hmm. yeah. because it subtracts one inch from the unit's move characteristic yep. so you could potentially move them if you're then halving it uh, then you're you're halving it based on that new characteristic mm-hmm. that could be bad um, and it's a six to cast which is not bad no, and you do good. D3 more wins as well. Yep. So, See, I kind of like myself. I like the Curse of Rust, which is a casting value of 7. But if you cast it, pick an enemy unit with 12 inches of the caster that is visible to them. Subtract one from hit rolls and save rolls for that unit until your next hero phase. I just, that's one heck of a debuff. Yeah. Yeah. Com- Having played against the netters at the weekend, I completely agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, minus one to hit, and then the additional bonus of minus one on your save roll. Yep. Um, and also because re rolls become before modifiers, mm-hmm. it's it was actually super frustrating playing against something with a minus one to hit because I had re rolls to hit, but oh. I couldn't re roll the things that were on a four, even though I was hitting on a five. Yeah. <laughs> so there was anything that came off a four was just like, damn, damn it. It. <laughs> um, it just became this mysterious sort of range that you couldn't re-roll, but yeah. wasn't going to hit anyway. Yep. So yeah, minuses to hit are definitely fun. Yeah. Especially if you get minus a couple of minuses to hit, you know, if you're, if you are that moon clan army, you're going to be seeing that coming through uh, and just lots of debuffs. Just, yeah. yeah, modifiers. Definitely. Rule, uh, rule of Burning Iron. It's casting value of 8, so a little bit high. Mm-hmm. Pick an enemy unit within 12 inches, and for every 6, take a more wind again. It's a horde. Yeah. Spell. That's a horde um, buster. Okay. But it's probably the biggest damage one on this list, so it's pretty cool. Yep. Molten Gaze. Not going to cover it because it's another one of those draw one millimeter line. It's only cast on a 6, but... Mm-hmm. You pick a point on the battlefield within 12 inches of the caster that's visible to them, draw an imaginary straight line millimeter wide between that point and the closest part of the caster. Each unit other than the caster that has models passed across by the line suffers a mortal wound. But it's just one, and it's per unit. So, yeah, I'm not in love with that one at all, even a little bit. So, Yeah, I think transmutation has... Uh, we're pretty much gone through everything now, but transmutation... Uh, cast value is seven. Pick an enemy unit within 18 inches of that caster visible to them. Roll three dice for each dice roll that's greater than the, the unit's wounds characteristic. One is slain. That could be good for taking out brutes or mm-hmm. uh, even pushing it for any fi- you know any sixes you roll. Could take out a uh, Dracoth Knight. Yeah. Um, you know, it has potential, but again, it's a seven to cast. So yeah, it's it's pretty high. But it has a decent range, eighteen inch range. It, it's one of those you could take a chance on it. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's that's a weird, that's a long shot. So especially for those tougher units. Now you going up against you know two wound stormcast, it might be fun. So, yeah, take out three stormcast, boom, mm-hmm. boom, boom. Yep, be nice. Yeah. So that's the magic, pretty much utility. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I I can't see you casting. I'd say maybe the rust, yeah. Which I, 
I do think is, is kind of cool. Outside of that, I can't see you pushing away your own spell unless your own spell is pretty terrible. Yeah. Get out there and cast it. So a lot of those are situational. They're, they'll make sense only when they make great sense, but then they're fantastic. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's take a look at the the artifacts. So I'm, let's start with um, the weapons. And okay. what's your favorite pick from the weapons? Oh, you're putting me on the spot here because there's a few that I like. <laughs> but the problem with them is some of these weapons work directly against some of the other realm abilities. Like I like the rune blade. Pick mm-hmm. one of the bearer's melee weapons to be a rune blade. That weapon has a wound, a rend characteristic of minus three. But the problem is, is you could very well roll and get rid of that rend. If you took this as an artifact, it's wasted. So. Yeah. It, it frightens me that, you know, things like that one kind of, they make me Which wonder. It, it makes it super weird, right? So you, you're from Shimon. You bring your rune blade, but your rune blade is worse if you fight in Shimon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why did they develop that? Yeah, I think that that one. I mean, minus three rend, right? Is great on yeah. a low, low rend attack. Uh, for the rest of the time when you're playing in the other, other realms, um, the weapons aren't too crazy though. No, which is is weird because you would think Shimon Mel Mel weapons. Yeah, but none of these are really crazy. I like the shamanite darts. Did you re- did you go look at those? Yeah, I mean you're, you're on average going to do what one wound. Well, one yeah, wound. you're rolling six yeah. dice and you need sixes to do a mortal wound. But if you're rolling hot, that could be really cool. But again, I don't like to take an artifact that I then have to roll a six up with. Ugh. Right, and that's what most of these are in this this realm. Yeah, you know, um, for the weapons anyway. Yep. Um, Reroll and hit rolls of one for the weapon. It's not bad. Nope. For Argentine's tooth, but there's better, better stuff elsewhere. Yeah, I think. Which I think when we go into the relics, this is a really strong sort of realm for negating stuff and 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 helping. Yeah. On there, so. Yeah, it's yeah. to me the the weapons in Shaman are just all very, blech, you know, they're. Yeah, I don't like them. I just don't like any of them really all that much. Yeah, I agree. So, um, across from the the relics, however, you have Gilden Bane. Oh boy, which <laughs> it would have to be my favorite on here. So, uh, if the enemy model is a bearer of an artifact of power, they cannot use the rules for that artifact of power while they're within three inches of um, the bearer. So. Not only does that shut down the artifact, but it also some of the scenarios, yeah, are, places arcane power require you. One of the rules for their artifact power would be that they have one, and you're shutting it down. Yeah. So would they be able to claim it? An objective oh. that'd be an interest. I'd have to. Or could you just walk on in and and take it? I'd have to say, even though it negates its power, you still have an artifact. Even though it's been negated, I don't know. I'd have to get a real official reading on that. So Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, shutting down the doppelganger cloak or yeah. anything that you've pretty much paid 50 points for. Yeah, it's going to be big. It, yeah, definitely. Uh, and it'll make your opponent change. Like, even just the threat of that mm-hmm. potentially could could make your opponent second guess yeah. what to do with the the stuff and change their so. moves which you know if you can alter what they what they want to do you're you're winning so exactly myself i like the hydroxkin cloak because this thing is to me it's a beast you the hydroxkin cloak is the bearer can fly and then mm-hmm. after the bearer has made a normal move you can pick one unit that has any models that the bearer has passed across and roll a die on a three up. It suffers D three mortal wounds. I think that's super strong. Not only do you get to fly, which, you know, some people say is bad, but I, I like in this game. And, um, but really that that's not a hard one. The three up, I don't mind so much as these four and five and six ups three up is, 
you know, better than 50, 50 <laughs> chance. So, and it's D three mortal wounds. So it's not bad. No, no, not, not surely just one more win for me, but well, sure um, for you. <laughs> um, I think it, it'd be interesting to try and find something that has a high movement and a small base. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't already fly. Even if it does, it doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're maybe not paying for that fly move. Yep. If you already have it, but something that can move pretty quick, they can just run over maybe a support piece that you don't want in combat anyway. They can just run and fly over, you know, a single character or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely has some utility there for sure. So what about the rest of these? We should have probably gone in order because they're all pretty interesting. They they are. I think minus one to hit for attacks and melee weapons is good. There's other realms that do it better. Yeah. Um, That's the Argent armor. So, yeah, the Argent armor. Yeah. Um, the Godrot helm on a six plus, ignore the wind. Yep, it's a six um, up death save. So yeah, that combined if you're fighting in Shimon with the the command ability. Yeah. Suddenly you've got two sixes. Yeah, it's kind of uh, nice. It's not bad. No, no, no. And no. Um, the Bejeweled Gauntlet again, it's hard to justify it. Yeah, I think that's a tough one because it's so. At the end of the combat phase, pick an enemy unit within one inch of the bearer and roll a die. On a three up, it suffers one mortal wound, but that's at the end of the combat phase. So that's a very strange. It would would have been better if it was pick or roll a die for every enemy unit Mm -hmm. rather than just one. Yeah. Um, Because there there are some times where you leave something on one mortal wound. Yeah. Or one wound. But then if you take the hydroskin's cloak and fly over them and then charge them and fight them. Mm-hmm. you've done that wind anyway. That's so right. So it's, yeah, situational. And then the last one, Archimedal Chain, you can you can unbind like a, yeah. a wizard. Yep. Again, not bad if you think you're going to go up against heavy magic. Well, and it's good for those those four, you know, the Thunder Tusks and all that stuff that, or um, the Beast Claw Raiders that don't have a lot of magic built in. So mm-hmm. at least this gives you a shot at unbinding. So Yeah, corn. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, an extra unbind. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Overall, I think I don't think you're going to see many armies from Shimon. No. Based on the utility of those items, you'll I see think you narrative see armies coming from there because it offers a lot of very interesting narrative options. But tournament play wise, I don't think you're going to see this that much. There's just there's so much better offerings in other realms. Yeah. Yeah, unless you want something super cool or you want to give rend to, you don't want to be, you know, th- those minus three rend swords seem to be everywhere. Yeah, everybody's got one in the list. Um, so, yeah. Um, so it's then just what flavor do you want? So <laughs> if that's the one that you want, maybe you go from Shimon. Yep. Just for, what I would have liked to have seen is for these artifacts, when they're being fought in the realm that they're they're from, having an additional effect. Because then it, it does start to make it a choice. Right. Um, and even if it's just on a, if fighting in Shimon and you roll a six plus, you get this addition. Sure. Yeah. Different effect. Or it makes it a little bit stronger. So. Yep. Cool. Well, I think that's another episode. I do. I do um, so. But we have one thing to do before we wrap this one up. We do. We do. You're correct. So what I want to talk about now is the prize giveaway that we're going to do over the next three episodes. And we're not doing this one for likes on Facebook or likes on iTunes. We're actually trying to be in the holiday spirit and uh, just give stuff away. So here's the deal. Over the last bit of time, I have accrued a lot of stuff from different conventions and going to the new hobby expo. And like I said before, at the beginning of the show, you know, um, our Warhammer store manager has gone way above and beyond the call of duty to, to give us the stuff that he no longer needs to have in the shop so that we can sort of spread the wealth a little bit. So I'm going to make six boxes and just fill it up with random stuff. And then keep in mind, this isn't high dollar stuff. We're not talking about, you know, tons of models from GW or something. It's going to be just stuff that was given away at the different stores, the different pins, the different uh, art card sets, the posters from the Black Star Blackstone Fortress, 
I mean, I don't think you need to give that away. I think that that would look really good on my wall. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, let's just edit that part okay, out. So um, no, <laughs> one of the boxes won't have posters in it. <laughs> I, I think it's is is going to be a this kind of stuff that you could get from a Games Workshop if you pre-ordered, if you took part in their right. hobby stuff, if you went to their different events, you know, all the different but some people, little things. Some people can't get to That's game right. workshop stuff, right? Exactly. There's there's not sometimes. either it's not close or you weren't there for that event that day. Who knows what you get? But also to sweeten the pot and to randomly interject some fun to it, one of the boxes is going to have a set of games and gears brushes in it that was mm. donated to us by the guys out there at Games and Gears. Nice. I bought all my games and gear brushes. I'm gonna make sure those go out to uh to someone else. Also, in one of the boxes, randomly, is going to be a Badger airbrush. This thing is brandy new. I'm not going to say how I got it. It's definitely a quality airbrush. It's not one of their bottom of the line ones. It's actually one of their pretty good top of the line ones. So somebody's going to get that. And the way we're going to run this contest is reasonably simple. At the end of this episode, which is kind of now, we're going to announce a magic word. And... All we're looking for is tweets or on our Facebook page, just put the hashtag and that secret word that we're going to tell you here in a minute. And all the people that have done that, we're going to put them into a list. We're going to randomly pick one of our Patreons and one person that isn't a Patreon. We're going to send them boxes. So I will email you and ask you for your mailing address if I don't have it. And we'll just send you a random box of loot. Have no idea what it's going to be worth. I mean. It's just it's just crazy fun stuff for the holidays. And we just kind of want to give back and share with the folks out there. Sounds great. Sounds sounds really good. But what will our special word be? Our That's s- the question. Our special word of the day. You know, I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you pick this one because I'm I'm kind of at a loss. Well, I feel like Azir has not contributed enough Ooh. to this episode. So I feel like we're gonna pick one of the random places in there so sigmarabulum Ooh. is our word so hashtag sigmarabulum yeah and it has to be spelt correctly so that makes it a little <laughs> bit more of a challenge <laughs> oh, I love it. um yeah it's got sigma in there it's got an obulum um <laughs> it's got six smiths yeah. and it's really hard to say yeah. so <laughs> so that's um, our new secret word Secret word for this for show. For this show. Yes, just, just to be for clear, this show. We'll, we'll change it up every show. So That's right. Um, and we may choose the realm. We may choose something else next time. So There you go. We'll see how that goes. So Okay. Okay. That's a wrap. Sounds good. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Speak to you all there. Yep. Bye. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can reach us on our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash rolling bad podcast all one word our patreon page is at www.patreon.com slash rolling bad podcast again all one word the twitter account for the show is at rolling underscore bad and our individual twitter accounts are for me at bill castello c-a-s-t-e-l-l-o and for ryan he is at rt gamer All of our guests on the show will have their contact information in the show notes, and any products that we mention will also be similarly placed in the show notes. The music for the show is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com and used under the Creative Commons license. Stormcaster, cool. You know, you tell someone, hey, we're recording. Can you keep it down? And he's like, I'm a five-month-old puppy. Yeah. Would you want me I to own you. <laughs> yeah. Stormcaster, cool. And then God spoke. <laughs> um. it's, it's okay. Apparently, you know, hey, I'm recording a podcast means hammer shit. And, and, oh, that's funny. Stormcaster, cool. Um, is something whistling at your place or mine? What, the fire alarm? Is that yeah. yours or mine? That's mine. Oh, because <laughs> I'm guessing that's what they're installing right now. I was gonna say, should you be leaving? <laughs> nope. <laughs> I should be texting my wife. <laughs>
Stormcaster. Cool. Let me just give a quick run through. And you can edit this so it makes it look like we're totally I was gonna say, good at this. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna sound good no matter what. And of course I'm gonna put uh, this in the blooper, so <laughs> awesome. Great. Um Stormcaster, cool. Oh god, I don't want to get this wrong. Okay, give me a second here. I gotta look at it and make sure I get the right one. <laughs> you could just say a badger badger airbrush. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll do that. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. There is going to be... <laughs> Yeah, I just really screwed that one up. Okay. <laughs> Stormcaster. Cool. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. two of them. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Um, we're just breaking all kinds of rules. Yeah. Here. Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, no one knows what the rules the rules do anyway. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. Make them up as you go right. along. Come on. Yeah. It's more fun that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah.